Yeah, it's the theme song for the Gear Podcast. Welcome to this pod. Gonna cast to your ears. G'day, Uncle Leon. How How's going, mate? What's going on? My arms are wide open for you, Troy. Welcome back. How was your holiday, mate? It was good, mate. We took a little week off, um, but that was okay. Episode came out a little bit late and uh, it was fucking bloody ripper dipper. Actually, it wasn't late. It was just like perfect timing, but um, last one was a fun episode. Yeah, and thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in. Saw that one got a little spike in numbers, which we're always happy about. Uh, as always, you know, tell your mates about the gear podcast if they like two blokes, sometimes three blokes, sometimes multiple blokes, sometimes female blokes talking about gear, then, uh, yeah, tell them to subscribe. You can get it on your favourite podcast app. And, of course, I put the episodes up with video on my channel. Speaking of gear, how did you go, like, without a week of, you know, being in being in the studio and having all your fun things? Or did you find a bunch of gear to go and check out while you were in Adelaide? I'll ask you, what do you think I've been thinking about in the last week? Oh, it's either and there's, Marshall it's literally, or it's, it's Synergy one, or... There's one whole thing I've been thinking about, and we haven't spoken about this at all, and it's uh, it's probably not what, you th- gonna th- what you'll think, and you probably won't pick it, but I'll just uh, have a guess. Acoustic guitars? No. Okay, I'm wrong then. Way off. You're going to have to fill more, me give, in. Two more guesses. Go. Go. Two obsessed, more guesses. Obsessed. Obsessed. What would Tondi be obsessed with? He does like amps. So, is it amp-related? Am I getting closer? No. Okay. Is it cabinet-related? No. All right, mate. I'm out. You're going to have to tell me. Mate, all I can think about, all that goes through my brain is drums. Oh. <laughs> There's a big, big sound. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what started it. This is like, obviously, not the demographic of our listeners, but um, I think I, I mentioned to the owner of the studio uh, a few weeks ago about how I'd like to get another drum kit for uh, when we do sessions and... Sometimes the Pearl reference that's down there, which sounds really great, it's not the exact right sound. So it'd be cool to, to um, just try something else out. So then um, I just started thinking it or trying to look at other drum kits that may be available or of interest. And then I started deciding to uh, watch videos about people tuning drums. And then I it just went nuts. So, I mean, on the, on the plane to Adelaide, um, I was sitting there and I had like maybe 15 minutes to take off. And I was like, man, it was like, it was probably what, five o'clock in the afternoon and two young children, two and four, and uh, got to keep them entertained, but they may just get zoned out with the iPad. So if that happens, dad can just watch a YouTube video. You know what I mean? So like trying to think, what can I find? What can I find? So I just, I downloaded a bunch of stuff, tuning and, you know, heads and all that sort of stuff. I went through this phase in 2015. I've got obsessed but I never like really uh, got good at tuning, excuse me, or really learned that much. So I'm back into it. So anyway, like yesterday, I taught my TAFE class and we did a big thing about, you know, tuning kick drums and you know, nerding out on that, which is cool. Um, I was having a little look today as well before we did this pod and before I had another little vocal to, to track. So, mate, that's what's been on the agenda. It's a downward spiral, isn't it? It's worse than worse than the worst drug you might get out there it's just once like, you get into the drum zone you, it's just there's so much to learn man it's just like not it not in just drums but you know i feel like um before i left so i have an orange pedal baby on the way which That's i'm really awesome. excited about i got a really good deal on this orange pedal baby so when that shows up i'm going to do some tests with that um running the synergy system maybe through the ada i'm going to just do a bit of a thing i might even do a video had a bit of encouragement from a um, friend of the channel, Jason, about maybe doing a, uh, like making a couple of videos, not necessarily guitar related, but studio or whatever. But um, yeah, I've got some ideas with this, with this little pedal baby thing. So, and I have, you know, a Wicked Freyette Fry- power amp over there to try out, to A beat against. I've got a Synergy Sin 30. There's a couple of things that would be kind of cool to try out. So um, you never know, mate. Uh, but bef- yeah, before I left, I was thinking about ways I could um, shoot them out for my own benefit. And, um, yeah, then like the day before, all of a sudden drums come into my Because you brain. bought a snare drum, right, during your last drum phase? I bought three snare drums. Okay, only three, I think. right? Maybe four. I, I feel you. No, th- four. I bought four. Um, How often do you use them? You know what? I use two of them quite a lot. That's uh, cool. One of them quite a lot. One of them a little bit. 
the other two not that much. But um, it's like having a, I mean, you know, if you're a producer or a recording engineer, having a good mic collection, having a good collection of outboard gear, having a good snare. I think it's something that people don't kind of realize, especially guitar players, where you know we're very specific about the things we use in our rigs to get particular sounds and you know even the tuning we use on our guitars and stuff like that and yeah you kind of forget that drummers and other instrumentalists often do that yeah uh, except keyboard players because i've never played with a keyboard player who doesn't just bring up preset one on like <laughs> the crummiest keyboard and just play a whole gig with it yeah um are they the most dead inside or <laughs> have they just got life figured out yeah well i will say actually uh from our last episode, I think I spoke about strings a little bit. You know, yes. I, I tried those strings. I gigged with that um, guitar with the, the uncoated, the whatever the Ernie Ball things were. How'd you find it? Uh, fucking sick, man. Really liked awesome. it. Loved the heavier strings. Loved the 22 on the G string as well. That felt really good. So Big chunky boy. I haven't, I think I did only one gig with it on Friday night. And um, I've got two gigs this weekend as well. So I'll, I'll drag it out again and, and have another play. Um, what I'm really interested on, well, not maybe not really interested, but I'm interested to see how worn the strings feel having not played the guitar for a few weeks and like how crusty yeah, they got. Yeah, right. Because I, although, you know, I, stupidly, I thought NYXLs were coated strings, but they're not. So. Interesting. I've just been using like the same set of NYXLs on a guitar for like six months <laughs> and just been like, this is fine. Well, what we really need to get into, Troy, are just using flat wounds and oh. uh, then never changing the strings. Have you put flat wounds on a guitar? I haven't, but I've been I've been wanting to do it. Uh, the last time I played flats was probably that gem that Umesh got converted to fretless. Oh yeah, They're, which was yeah. weird. I don't, I don't know. I I haven't spent that much time on them, but I, the I did it once when I was um, 16, 17, and I was at school and um, I was playing in the jazz band. Even though I can't play. I can't play jazz. I don't know anything about jazz, but... Why would you? I was in the school band and um, had a guitar teacher that had one of the George Benson Ibanez signature guitars. Which I've was, met that guy, haven't I? Rob, yeah, yeah, you met him. Yeah. And um, great player, like really great player, great teacher. Um, but he had flats on that guitar and it was kind of cool. And because I thought maybe it was, a, it, I should play jazz because that would be like hell smart. Um, I chucked him on, uh, on a guitar, but do you know what I was playing in high school, Leon? I, again, because you know you're dumb and you read something and it feels like a good idea. I was playing like an acoustic guitar in the jazz band, just because like, why not? Like that's I don't have an, a a semi hollow guitar and everyone plays acoustic guitars. I was playing acoustic guitar. Done. Exactly. That's that's basically jazz, isn't it? Yeah. It actually kind of works too because it's you get a different, uh, you know, like uh, the, the attack on it's really different. It's like, you know, when you play a. Um, a guitar which doesn't, I guess, resonate in the same sort of way, has a bit more shock. Yeah. You know um, who the absolute most insufferable forum people are? Are jazz guys on forums? Hmm. And you all know what I mean. I don't mean like the majority of guitar players who play a bit of jazz or do jazz gigs. <laughs> most of them are reasonable human beings, but there is a, there is a type of jazz guy who there is, you know, Deals in absolutes, and it's yeah. like, how do I get a real guitar tone for playing real jazz, you know? Yeah. And then they'll go on and they'll list, like, you know, some John Abercrombie live bootleg from whenever, and it's like, yeah, that's the realest jazz that was ever real. And then you just get everybody else on the forum is, like, a rock, metal, or indie player, and they're like, oh, uh, yeah, you know, you can probably just use a Fender Deluxe. No, it needs to be a real, you know, it's like... It's one of those, it's it's the soup Nazi from Seinfeld, mm. um, just that, but without the ability to cook soup, yeah. um, you know? So, yeah, that's just that's just a thing. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, I look, I don't want to name when and where I had this. It was a non-interaction, mm -hmm. basically, but I kind of overheard this conversation at some point over the last fortnight, and it was actually like listening to a guitar forum mm -hmm. where- someone was talking about their Vox amp and then like their influences, which were basic. if you watched or listened to last week's episode, you know what I'm on about. <laughs> and, you know, I was like lampooning this person, but they were real and they seemed to be enjoying their life and, you know, playing some decent guitars. So 
as always, you know, when I've got a problem with something, it's my problem. But yeah, it was sort of like, oh, this is the John Frusciante fan come to life. And shout out to our buddy, Chris Samacovitis, who loves the chilies and loves John Frusciante. And uh, yeah, nothing personal against anyone who does that. But uh, someone did write as well to check out where's this comment. I'm just recapping from last week. Uh, someone mentioned check out Mother's Milk by the Chilies as well. So that is going to be on my listening. I've got it's a worth gig that I'm flying out. out to tomorrow. So I'll check that one out and oh, ch- try to change my mind. So uh, two things. Firstly, I felt bad that we were shitting on Chili Peppers knowing some people that we know that listen to the podcast and love Chili Peppers. Um, so I felt bad about that. Also felt real bad because I feel like we went super hard on Jason at the start of that episode. Like <laughs> just kept laying into him, laying into him. And he's the nicest dude. And it was just, yeah, I almost asked you to take it out, but he- uh, Yeah, I think I think people who aren't Aussies or Kiwis need to realize that this is just what we do. Yep. And that line, that what is a fine line in other cultures between- jovial fun and mean spiritedness is spiritedness spiritedness is like it's actually like a a massive gray area it's just where basically everything happens when you're an aussie or a kiwi so it's totally fine and uh you know also shout out to jason and the all blacks because uh they're playing i mean that kind of feels like a bit of a the all blacks are playing south africa in the rugby world club club Words are hard today, Troy. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, probably by the time this comes out, the game will have been played. But lots of South Africans in Perth, lots of Kiwis, and, uh, yeah, they they do love their rugby yep. and their cricket as well. So, uh, yeah, shout out to anyone in Perth listening or anybody from all around the world who's got their team playing a game of sport. Mm-hmm. There are a few other little things that I wanted to pick up on as well. Uh, shout out again, friend of the podcast, John Brown, who was – talking about getting into like mic preamps and 500 series stuff and that being a much, much bigger <laughs> kind of rabbit hole than uh, oh, guitar gear. And just, just also someone start. mentioned some power metal and they said Stradivarius, yeah. Sonata, Arctica, Twilightning. These are all bands that I absolutely loved in my teens. So, Can uh, you imagine? It, like we, it wasn't a mistake, but like that formative period of our lives when we, like I remember like, just smashing like one Sonata Arctica album in probably like 2007 and um, like loving it, you know, loving Man. it. And then I had one Stradivarius song too in high school called, I think it was Which called one? I, I Walk Alone or something. It was I, right. I Walk, or, I don't know. But just that was like the song that um, friend of the show, Gareth, just introduced to us and smashed it. But it's like, you know, imagine if we were just like listening to the music that our peers were listening to. Like- not our musical peers, but our just people that went to school with us or university. Like, We'd imagine if we liked w- Arctic Monkeys. Actually, I, I heard a band play some Arctic Monkeys on the weekend and they did a pretty decent job of it. And I There's was like, ah. Oh, good songs. I know this song. Yeah, but, exactly. But like no, Modest it's... Mouse in 2006, if someone told me you liked that, one of my friends, sorry to cut you off, one of my friends that used to play a band with, Alex, great drummer, like we were smashing Dokken in high school and then- Two years later, he's like, yeah, I've been really getting into like Modest Mouse and this stuff. And I've just been like, ever since then, what's wrong with you? What happened? Yeah. What happened to you? We, we've, we've become like uh, Italian grandparents. Where it's just, why are yep. you doing this with your life? But uh, also, yeah. let, let me just say- Normcore. Why, what, you know, look, was it a hindrance or was it a benefit to be non-normcore as a teenager? I think every teenager feels non-normcore, but most of them are normcore. Um, I can I can tell you something, Uncle Leon. Would you, but would you like to hear it, mate? I always oh, want to hear what you've got to say. Hang on, I'll, I'll, I'm going I'm to tell you, but I have to get this open. Here we go. All right, I'm almost there, mate. Are you ready? Are you ready to rock? First thing in the morning, got to play that guitar. He's a hard rock m- rebel, sounding like a star. His mama shouts to turn it down. You're pushing it too loud, way too loud. But Michael dreams and doesn't care. He's going for the crowd. Michael wants to rock all around the clock. You can hear it down the block that Michael learns to rock. He's playing like a Superman. That boy can play. Now, Leon, over the last week of not doing a podcast with you, really our main interaction has been me sending Yon Lunday lyrics to you back and forth. So there's that's um, Rock Spirit. I think that's on the uh, 
That was the Norwegian philosopher Jorn Lande. (laughs) Yeah. No, sorry, he was actually a social scientist. But yeah. Uh, yeah, man, like the other thing that amazed me while we're speaking about Jorn Lande, so anyone who's not from Perth <laughs> won't understand this, but every city has the cover bands that all play the same songs. There's mm-hmm. the standard 30 or 40 songs, you know, like you've been to Nashville mm-hmm. and I remember you distinctly saying, uh, what song was it? Was it Strawberry Wine or something? You were like, yeah, this is the like that the was summer then. of 69. Like, for some reason, everybody played that song like 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was. Yeah, it was like that and Wagon Wheel, but you were comparing them to songs that are in set lists here. Like, yeah, Summer of 69, everyone does it. You know, that's the Jesse's Girl. That's the <laughs> April Sun in Cuba kind of thing. So, uh, <laughs> Jorn Lande could get a gig in Perth with the songs he's covered, like John Farnham and Christopher Cross, Ride Like the Wind. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one that you sent as well? It was so, he's got like multiple covers albums, like Don't yeah. Stop Believing's on there. Yep. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. The Ride Like the Wind was a surprise. Didn't love the version. It was a bit too chugga chugga, to be honest. Yeah. But, but he sounded great on it, yeah, which I mean, he, he basically great. always does. Um, the I can't remember if we mentioned it last week, but someone in the comments did mention the Beyond Twilight album he's on. I which didn't is, listen to that. Yeah, I've got it on CD. Because I basically, <laughs> there used to be a place in Fremantle called the CD Library, mm-hmm. and then I think it was Junction Records, and there was a Swiss guy who worked there, and like he was my melodic rock drug dealer. Basically, <laughs> I'd go in every other week, and he'd be like, "Oh, we got this from Frontiers, and we got this from Inside Out Music," and uh, I've still got some CDs that I paid like you know forty dollars for mm. that I've just never listened to. I'd go and spend like. 200 bucks on random melodic rock CDs. But yeah, that's where I got a lot of that Yorn Lande stuff. Yep. And you, you know, always, there was some really good always stuff. had the coolest stuff. Ark, like I think that came up last week or maybe in yeah, the Yeah, man. But Burn like, the Sun, like yeah. slamming album. There's um all that stuff, not, not all of it, a lot of it's on, well, I use title, but I found a lot of it um, last week when I was looking for it. So I couldn't find, I think it was Millennium, I couldn't find. Um, at that's least hard. On streaming, like it's probably on um, something else, but. I had it had the like a MP3 version of it a long time ago, but my music drive of all my cracked music from being a child yep. just doesn't work anymore, which is really oh, sad. No. There's stuff I oh, downloaded no. in like there's one song, right? Because we all use LimeWire back in the day, and there was always that song that was like Jimi Hendrix unreleased, you know, da da da, or World's Greatest Guitar Player, World's Greatest bon, Guitar Solo, all this sort of stuff. Bon Scott and Jimi Hendrix collaboration, never yeah. heard before. And so, you know, you don't know any better, so you download this stuff. But there was one um, there was one song that I downloaded, and I really, I used to listen to it all the time, and I really liked it. Never found out who the real artist was, because it was just literally like, World's Greatest Guitar Solo, Jimi Hendrix, da, 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 like Steve Ray Vaughan, listen to all this stuff. Um, but the intro, I still remember how it goes. I still play it once in a while. It just kind of is like locked into my fingers. It's really funny. So anyway, that song is lost to the... Like, no, mate, you just have to play it at the end of the episode and I'm sure some avid reader will recognise it yep. and, you know, you won't have to cry about it anymore. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah that ARC album is really, really good, Burn the Sun. I've mm. listened to that a lot. Some very, very good playing on it. The Millennium album I found on eBay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've got them all. I've got the first two albums and then they had like a greatest hit style thing. I own them on CD. This is how much of a Yorn Lande like fanatic I was back when people paid money for music. Mm-hmm. You know, the amazing thing. But yeah, uh, Hourglass is the album. Now, yeah. I've listened to that album recently and every song, like every riff, every melody is just like a remix of something that already exists. <laughs> like there's literally a song, I'm pretty sure it's the song chasing time at the end of the album that is it's a kansas song and i heard this kansas song i was like oh my god that's like the the syncopation in the rhythm section the riff it's just the same thing Mm -hmm. and they basically just changed the words and the arrangements a little bit so i was like man this is mind-blowingly cool uh and now i listen to i'm like i still have a soft spot for these songs i can kind of hear where they're pulling things from. It was uh, Ralph Santola on guitar who played with Death, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, and who passed away recently, which is really sad because I really, that actually that Millennium album, I spent a lot of time transcribing and like stealing licks from. Right. Um, there's some really cool things that he was doing that I was like, yeah, this is kind of how I want to play guitar. So 
Yeah, RIP Ralph, great you know, li- player. Listening to some of that stuff, um, there is a real, uh, you can, like, there's a real ragdoll thing about that, I think, <laughs> subconsciously. Like, even when, because, you know, there was a period when, um, you know, everything that we did, like, you know, I say we, but, like, ragdoll was still in standard tuning. Like, yeah. drop D didn't, or E flat or whatever, but drop D didn't really occur to, to us because, you know, like, like 80s metal and uh, don't like drop D grunge sort of stuff. But it's like when you, I feel like when you discover Drop D, there's this like subconscious influence of like, what's the guy's name? Um, the, the guy that has this, Magnus Carlsen, not the chess player, yes. the guitar player. I'm so glad we got to this because I was just going to say, who's the guy who played on all those like Alan Lande albums? Yeah. He'd be cool to get on the podcast, actually. Yeah. I feel like he'd have some really, I'd love to know what he used on all of that kind of Man, stuff. because they're great guitar sounds. Like they must be just 5150s is what it sounds like to me. Yeah, man. And what was his band, Last Tribe? Oh, maybe. I yeah, remember. I have those albums on CD. I bought them. Mm-hmm. I have n- never listened to them. Right. Because I feel like I bought them off eBay and it was like they took forever to come around and I had, you know, I just never got got the chance. Like I've listened to them on streaming mm-hmm. years later, but yeah, I had the CDs and just never listened to the, like the CDs are unopened. But yeah, it would have to be because I know who is the other band. So Jorn Lande's solo project the you know it's called Yawn, and yep. the uh, the guy playing guitar on it for most of it is what Yawn Vigo Lofstad from yep. a band called Pagan's Mind, and he was like um, Music Man guitars into a fifty one fifty, and I have those first two Pagan's Mind albums, and the the guitar sounds on them are sick, mm. and it's just it's like it's the Yawn guitar sound, it, like it must be just like boosted fifty one fifty. It sounds like you know. AMGs to me as well. Yeah, I, I wouldn't so. be surprised if it was like uh, the Fredman mic technique as well, like mm-hmm. just that, you know, whatever they were doing up in Scandinavia in the 90s, like 5150s and pointing things. Uh, yeah, they're very, very good guitar sounds. Um, yeah. I feel like a while ago you got something to, like this was, you know, a long time ago, you got something to mix from a local band and you sort of played it to me and you're like, yeah, this is where it is at the moment, like, someone had pre-mixed it or mix it and then you kind of A-beat it with one of those Yawn albums and it was just like, you know, the Yawn album just sounded so gigantically awesome. Mm, I don't remember which one that was, but okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a memory. So I, it was like, it was an easy A-B and I was like, oh yeah, this sounds good. And then I heard like that and I was like, whoa, yep. this sounds amazing. It's it was- just, um, It's really, that stuff's just really polished as well. Like they're, um, yeah, they're just- it's like, it, it's one of those weird guitar sounds where it's like, it kind of doesn't fit in a lot of genres of music. I was watching, um, related to this actually, um, a lot of friends of the channel today, as always, but, um, uh, mate, fucking, what's his name? Lugo, James Lugo. Yes. Um, had a Mark, oh. had a Mark IV. Yep. This was a it. roller coaster for me. Yeah, me too. I'm like... He's got a Mark IV. He loves the Mark IV. Okay, it's being serviced. He gets it back. Can't wait. Greatest guitar sound I've ever heard. And he had it like dialed. Like it sounded awesome. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, he's like sold the Mark IV. And I'm, I watched the little video where he talks about it. And he goes, man, it's such a great sound, but I've got no place for it. Because yeah. it just sounds like a, a Mark series amp. And it doesn't like fit in other stuff. And that's kind of, it's similar to what these other guitar sounds are to me. Like that, that Yawn guitar sound where it's, yeah, yeah it's so clear um, and kind of, I don't know if it's dry, if that's a way of describing it, but like, it just, it just, you can't, it sits like on top of other guitar sounds or other elements of a mix. And that's great. But yeah, sometimes it's hard to, to make work. So similar. Yeah. Big time. I mean, for anyone who's ever played an AC30 and been underwhelmed or played an old Marshall Plexi or a Deluxe Reverb and like not got it on its own, you know, those things are classics because they work when you're recording and you can do lots of different things with them. And they sort of like, you know, we talk about tone a lot, obviously, but like texture is important. Mm. And it's probably nowadays, if you're recording, it's f- as important, if not more important than the actual sound. Cause you can have like an isolated sound that you go, yeah, that kind of sounds terrible, but it's got something about it that works in a track. It sort of works texturally. So mm-hmm. I feel like th- these are words that I didn't understand when I was a teenager. I was like, nah, 
there's a good tone and that's Steve Vai for the love of God. <laughs> and then there's a bad tone and that's like, you know, anything before 1983 and that's it. There's just good and bad. But then, you know, I'd read about like, oh, you, just you know. Eddie Van Halen under the bus there, but okay. Yeah, well, you know, we all know that uh, Fair Warning is the best guitar sound. Actually, that was 81. So let's say pre-1981. Uh, <laughs> there's there's a for- Fair Warning cult out there as well yep. when it comes to Van Halen fans. Uh, what was I on about? But yeah, reading about guys like The Edge or, you know, stuff like that. And they're like, yeah, I'm a textural player. And I was like, what's that? That's not real. <laughs> but I so get it nowadays. Yep. Um, and, you know, you can do... You, I think most of my favorite players now kind of do both. Like you think about Ty Table, yep. you know, giant chungus, huge guitar sound, but also a lot of King's X stuff is quite textural mm-hmm. and, you know, beautiful sounding, um, you know. Yeah, and it's not Alex. just like throw your strum in Big Sky, like shimmer reverb, whatever that is. It's like yeah. it is more than that. It's just, yeah, making the instrument do something. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting. It's 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 tough to do. It's the compositional element of it as well. It's like kind of fusing like the sound and the textural approach and the song and the melodic aspects and the harmonic stuff. It's like it's all part of the same delicious Baker's Hill pie that you just <laughs> kind of put together. So yeah. yeah. Or like, you know, the edge is another great example of remember that what was that documentary they did? Make it loud or it might be loud, oh, like yeah, Jack yeah. White, The Edge, Jimmy Page. Mm-hmm. Um and I remember seeing, you know, someone who's still a buddy of mine, but they were just kind of like, oh, this was whenever that thing came out and they were all like, ha, 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 how crap is the edge? How cool is Jack White? And I was like, and they were like, yeah, he relies on effects. He can't play guitar. It's like, bro, <laughs> you know, whether you like U2 or not, you know, he is like a def- genre Era defining guitar player. And, you know, there's people out there who would argue, well, The Edge had nothing to do with it. It was Daniel Lenoir's production, whatever. Like Dave Evans, not the original singer from ACDC, <laughs> The Edge. Whether you like U2 or not, like you got to hand it to him. The way he made effects units relevant and, you know, like those classic albums. And, yeah, I'm not a massive U2 fan, um, but there's such a it's such a thing to lean into and realize. And there's such a good lesson in there. Like, oh, I'm good at doing this. So this is what I'm going to do rather yep. than conform to, you know, what people think a rock guitar player should be or a punk guitar player should be. So yeah, there's there's a real real lesson in there, I think. And, you know, their, cha- their sound changed a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, like that um, rig rundown with his tech is pretty yeah. insane. I mean, Man. from a, a signal flow perspective, but also, I mean, he was talking about how he still goes out and tunes the guitar sound every night to to make it work for him. Like, it's not when you when you're using that many effects, one little change is going to be significant along the rest of it. The amount of control that it takes, yeah, to touch. It's funny, right? Because it's difficult. sort of like if you think of the analogy with like food, right? U two is a really popular restaurant, mm-hmm. and Bono is the restaurant owner. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, and they're like, oh, we've got this great chef, The Edge, like he's the head chef. But really, <laughs> really, the reason the restaurant is successful is Dallas, uh, you know, and, you know, he's sharpening all the knives, he's doing all the prep, he's like the ultimate, like he's the sous chef of tone mm-hmm. or he's like the sommelier or something. Like, you know, he's <laughs> he's taking care of all the of that. Smelly air. Ed, yeah, smelly air. That's uh, Apparently that's what you get around a glass of wine and the smellier the air, the better. I don't know, <laughs> I don't drink, so... Yeah, there's there's that aspect of it. And, you know, it's – you can argue that they've descended into self-parody a long time ago, but, you know, they are also just one of those bands where, you know, they haven't gotten any smaller. They've mm. maintained that Titanic thing. And, like, when you go and see U2, like, every song has a really discernible guitar intro with a cool sound yep. that's different from song to song. So, yeah. But anyway, George Lynch, good, The Edge, bad. Yep. That's what I want to get back to. Uh, um, contrast that with, you know, definite friend of the podcast, Ingve Malmsteen. Yeah, go on. <laughs> like, uh, we, yeah. All right, talk to me about this this thing. So, look, everybody was getting excited that Rick Beato interviewed Ingve Malmsteen. I haven't watched the whole thing, 
But I think a lot of people were surprised that, yeah, he's a human being um, and not just a walking cartoon. <laughs> Although there's large parts of it where he's being a cartoon. But, mate. Rick Beato, you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Grandpa Simpson. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Um, he who shall not be named. But, mate, I interviewed Ingvay in 2015. Do you know about this? Uh, yeah, I think we've talk- spoken about it on this. Yeah, yeah. So I, re- I read parts of the... So it was a phone interview and it got trans... I didn't transcribe it, but Friends Rock Magazine, the, web, the, the rock pit had it, and it's still up there. And Blabbermouth pulled a few choice quotes from it and, you know, Ingve had a little viral moment. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get mentioned. <laughs> Don't deserve to. Uh, but, yeah, it was... Um, I'll just forever mention this in every podcast as well. Did you know that I interviewed Ingve Malmsteen mm. in 2015? And Jeff I, I did. But you forgot yeah. about that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, there was a few things. One of my students came in. He's like, oh, I watched the Ingve interview. And Ingve said he doesn't sweet pick in it. Um, so, look, either he misheard it or Ingve's just lying or Ingve doesn't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> Like, and Ing- you'd be very, su- I would not be surprised if Ingve didn't know what sweet picking was. Oh, like, 100%. No one and, said you know, that it's- to him. It's like Ingve, or oh, they've said it and he just isn't listening because he just plays guitar. Yeah, you know, and like, have you watched his instructional video? Uh, I've watched the like arpeggios from hell thing. Like, okay, the there's an REH one that he did in the late 80s, early 90s. And look, <clears throat> it's not instructional. But yeah. it is pure comedy value. <laughs> and anyone- I think we've actually spoken about this before, but yeah. Yeah, we've probably spoken about it. But, you know, there's this great <laughs> bit when he's like, here's my guitar. It's totally stock. And then rolls out like a list of 15 modifications that have been made to it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, talks about, there's this just bit where he goes, here's a chord progression that con- that contains a great number of chords. He plays the chords once and then just plays a guitar solo. Mm-hmm. Um, is that the, what, the one where he does like, <laughs> um, he plays the lick um, at speed. He goes, now I'm going to play it slower and plays it at the same tempo. <laughs> it's it's slightly slower, like, you know, <laughs> but it is not slow by anyone's definition. And that's the first thing he goes, uh, this is the fingering that I use for a diminished arpeggio. Brrr, and then it, and now slow. And you can tell it just would have been like a nightmare to edit. Um, but anyway, I was, there is a point to this story um, and we'll, we'll get to it. Because Ingvay's great. I love his guitar playing. I always will. The first five or six albums he did are awesome. Yep. Have you listened to his latest album, Troy? The last new Ingvay thing that I listened to was his blues album. Okay. Which is something that we joke about a lot. The word bad just comes to mind, and I'm pretty sure he recorded it himself. Yep. And that explains everything. And the point is, Ingvay is fucking amazing at what he does. But he's also the sort of person who, because he's an expert at one thing, assumes that he will just be an expert at everything he does. Mm-hmm. And this album sounds like someone using Pro Tools for the first time. Don't get me started on that. But yeah, uh, yeah. I know I've watched Ingve's, I think it's like on Instagram. I don't follow him, but I've seen like little bits of Ingve. And he's sitting in front of like a massive D control um, with his amps and his guitars and he's just shredding and stuff. It's like, I mean, that's in his house. Like, that's cool. He he clearly he has a he has a pro tool system he he's known sort of how to use it but like if you listen to some like early ingve sounds like pretty bad like sonically bad like the guitar playing yeah. is always amazing and the guitar it's not it's not stuff. high budget no but it's like you know drum machines and stuff like that's just what you get but it's like the world has evolved like where people do better than that you know what i mean it's like yeah you kind of can't put that out anymore and um and, and yeah there's a there's an al- I I don't really want to say what it is. There's a there's a guitar player that released an instrumental album recently, a very very famous guitar player, and their instrumental album is one of the worst sounding albums I've ever heard. Um, do you think it's also that same syndrome of like I can do this? No, I I don't know what's happening in that situation. It's just uh, I don't think they mixed it, but. Um, Oh, I don't know. I, I don't, maybe, maybe it's that thing of like, if you are so like, fo- like hyper focused on your guitar sound that nothing else matters and like everything else yeah. is like such a, I haven't listened to this album, so I can't tell you what I think about it, but I, I do definitely know, like if you, if you really don't have an ear for anything other than guitar sound, then 
kind of explains why something would be as terrible as it is. Don't grow old because your heroes will grow older faster than you and disappoint you more. <laughs> is uh, one thing, but then some some of you you know some of the heroes I had growing up are like still doing kind of cool stuff. Um, so yeah, just because you're an expert at one thing doesn't mean that expertise is going to carry over. And I feel like the m- more expertise you have at one thing, the the more you see of that. Mm. Where it's like, oh, I'll just do this thing and I'll be the greatest at it. You know, how hard can it be to you know be a great chef? It's like well. <laughs> You know, you've played guitar for 50 years. Those skills probably don't transfer over, but, you know, the maybe the ego does or something like that. Yeah. I've, um, I think I've said this to you before. It was like one of the reasons I don't do video stuff is that I, I'm like pretty good at Pro Tools and I know how long and how much work it took to get good at Pro Tools and understand, like, if I go to every menu of the Pro Tools window, like, I, I can tell you what they all do. Like, every, yeah. and I've opened up, like, well, DaVinci Resolve, for example. And it's just like, it's so overwhelming or Photoshop or something yeah, like man. that. It's like, I just don't, I don't care. Just getting back to Ingve. So let me ask you, had it been like, pick, like pick the best possible person to do an Ingve album. Like who would that be? <sighs> yeah, man. What a question. So, you yeah, know, who we comes can tie to these two threads together. Is, um, he had, yeah, you go. Oh, well, um. I've actually f- just forgotten his name. Um, what's his name? Does all the bottom master stuff. Australian guy. You know the Kevin guy. Shirley. Kevin Shirley. Do you yeah, reckon, like, perfect. He would be, I feel like if he can deal with Joe Bonamassa, he could deal with Ingo Malmsteen, right? So take someone of like incredible, um, uh, you know, taste and like execution and really like pedigree f- to do that job. If he was to do that album, do you think you'd like it more? Oh, Troy, what a loaded question. Uh, I'd probably just find something else to complain about, wouldn't I? Because I'm yeah, a prick. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because like- Yeah, it's a good in, point. There's a lot of stuff and I'll, there's actually something related to this that we can talk about in a second too, but um, it, like I obsess about recording and mixing and I, it, I, you, I love it, you know, I, like, and I, I just, I can't help myself. I'm obsessed with drums now and it's, it'll be something else next week. Um, but it's kind of like so, so much of this stuff doesn't really matter. Unfortunately, there's the, the learning aspect. Like that's what I'm obsessed with. I need to understand why something happens. But in terms of just expression, like music as an expression, like Ingve has done that, and he's really done. Like in his brain, he's painted yeah. the perfect picture of what he wants to hear and what he wants to give you. And I, in that sense, as bad as it is, as it is, I don't think you could really get any better than that. It's, yeah, it's kind of yeah. That's the catch twenty two, isn't it? Yeah, it's weird. Like I've um, you know, it's a it's a thing that I'm always not always thinking about, but I'm thinking about a lot these days with stuff that I do, where it's just like try and you know make make the song as good as possible. Like think about like okay, um, with you guys when I've recorded Ragdoll in the past, um, you know, we spoke about. I think it was on your live stream. I was talking about how earlier stuff there would be like twenty, thirty guitar tracks on the <laughs> yes. song, and now on the recent one there was like four or five. And um, back then, I was so obsessed with like my vision of what a song could be, and like really like making every like molding it, creating something to what my my dream is of something. When like that's okay, and I like to introduce that into projects. But ultimately, you're going to go out and play the song. It has to be your expression and your thing. Yeah, yeah. And that should be like number one, and mine should be number two. And so directing it in that way is is kind of more important and that means sometimes just like let the guitar sound be one guitar sound let the vocal be a little bit out of tune what it like you know i've had uh disagreements with people where it's like oh my, the bass is like way too loud for my taste but it's like well all right you're gonna listen to this once it's finished more than i am if you really want to yeah. hear it that loud that's probably okay i can probably live with that most of the time the tracks that i work on um with all due respect to my clients like they're not selling millions and millions of copies and so the expression of it like the the creative element to it is more yeah, important yeah. than like the well how are we going to get it on this radio station it's like who cares i think for me the thing that is different from especially when we started recording together is yeah you know you just kind of like the song is the song and it happens <clears> in <throat> the time continuum it happens in that it kind of does it's a representation of what you're into and what you dig mm-hmm. at the time and what 
you want to commit to. And I, I feel like now for me, it's like, you know, there's a good saying like a, a fast, a decision made quickly is a satisfying decision. Mm-hmm. So like you're pulling a guitar sound or something, it's like, all right, is that working? Great, let's move on. Rather than like obsessing over every single detail all the time. Now, maybe a little bit of obsession is good, but yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's I would still like to hear, look, I'd, I'd love to hear like Kevin Shirley produce Ingve and do like, you know, a Deep Purple style album where it doesn't have all the, um, you know, like string synthesizers and choirs and stuff like that. And it'd be cool in my head. Maybe I should do this. You know, I know two Ingve licks. <laughs> Kevin Shirley, I, what I, do you charge? Some of that though, it's like, it, it's weird. So uh, to go back. Like I'm just being one of those those people who's like, no, no, no. If 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 it happened the way I liked it, it would be good. But I don't think that's the case. I think I think I think you're correct. I'd still be like, ah, oh, well, you know, Eclipse still sounds better. So uh, yeah, I, I think mean, he's like still out c- there playing shows. Yeah, you know, doing the thing, and you know, so respect. I think ultimately you can't please everybody. So if you can't please everybody, the person you need to please <laughs> most is yourself. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's that's the point. But um. Oh, so yeah, um, last week when I was away, one one thing I just listened to, having not listened to it for fucking years and years, was the band Pain of Salvation. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, were we right? talking about this at all? I don't think we were. I don't think so, no. but did you go to the Dream Theater show they opened? No, I didn't know that they did that. Because they were ridiculous live. Like, you know, uh, like Anthony level frontman yep. stuff, freak show stuff. Well, like I, I used to listen to him a long time ago when I, I was more into that sort of music than say like Taylor Swift and I hadn't listened to it in said like 10, maybe 15 years. Um, and I just chucked it on cause there were some songs that I, there's still one song. I can't remember what it was called and I've like skipped through some albums to try to find it. Can't find it. Anyway, uh, they've got this album Remedy Lane that came out in like 2002 yep. and I used to love that album. And there's one song on there called, I think it's Trace of Blood, which is awesome. Love it. The lyrics on it are really cool too. Um, but they did a remix of it, of the album in 2016, and Jens Bogren did it. So oh, Jens right. Bogren, like, is, like, one of the, like, top-tier heavy metal, and has worked with them, like, for years as well, apparently. Not on the, the original version of it, but on the, he obviously remixed it and has done other albums. He is to but, what he is to post-2010s metal what Andy Sneap is to yeah, pre-2010 metal. Absolutely. And, you know, he's got Bogren Digital and the plugins and stuff. But the remix of that song that I like... I, and in fact, the entire album, like, I just didn't really like it. Um, it was good. But there was one thing actually that really, that bummed me out about it in that, um, in the verses, in the original, like, the the guitars sort of palm you and it feels like they've got this, like, extra boom, boom like, rumble after all of the yeah, notes. Right. And on all the palm mutes on this one, it's, like, really short and it feels, like, kind of a bit stilted and a bit weird to me. But it's that thing of, like, Technically, the original, there's like stuff about it where I'm like, oh, snare sounds a bit whatever. Oh, the whole doesn't really have the same amount of power. It doesn't have that modernness to it. But I think I'm not sure if I like it more because I listened to it so yeah. much long, long time ago. And and even having a more polished, better version of it, it just it still doesn't tickle my fancy. Maybe if I'd done it in the reverse order, it would be different. Yeah, it's right. Weird, but, you know, Interesting. But I guess like the, the ultimate... Um, point i'm trying to make is like good is super subjective and really meaningless and and like yeah not that we shouldn't try and strive for something that is good because when you're crafting something you still want it to feel you know the way that you still want to exp- exp- express it in a way but i guess you know talking about Ingve, um i would just assume his main thing is like what's the best like the coolest guitar that i can play and i think coolest is the best way of talking about Ingve. it's like not going to be the most like tasteful but like, yeah, yeah. what's the thing? No, that- you, you leave that at the door and yeah. that's part of the fun. And so like if he's ticked that box and that's awesome. Whereas like me as a producer, um, I have different things that I obsess about in a mix uh, or yeah, in, a, yeah. in a track. And um, and sometimes it's the like trying to capture the performance. Sometimes it's trying to craft the song and get the emotional element out in a different way or the, the vibe out in a different way. Like, it, you know, you can throw any buzzword that you like. But it's, yeah, a di- yeah. it's a different like thing to focus on. Um, none of it's right or wrong. It's just like we all have that little thing that we listen for more. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing to consider. Yeah, I think I, th- I think it's a you know it's a great perspective to have on it. Um, 
to go back to your earlier thing about if someone else did the album, would it be better? No, I think it would be equally as bad. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely really good things. Like, you know, equally as bad. There's some albums that by trying to make them sound better, you also make them sound worse. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though, you know, this is a thing is uh, like perfection's not a thing in music. Yeah. Um, and it, But you can fool yourself into thinking, if I change a few things in this that maybe I'm unhappy with or I can, you know, you actually risk just by changing, you know, once something's being sort of like heard and disseminated and ingested as a, you know, piece of art or craft, mm-hmm. going back and being like, oh, now we'll remix it or we'll do something. <clears throat> if you really change the if you really go hard with the remix and, you know, the way an electric, you know, you make it another genre or something, then, yeah, maybe that's going to come out kind of cool. But when it's just like, yeah, make make everything sound more modern, um, I, yeah, it's a good point. It's not necessarily going to be better. There are some albums <laughs> where, and it's, you know, say like The Master is terrible um, or something like that where there's, some technical part of like the album is done and it's mixed. Like where does this stop is what I'm getting at. But, you know, maybe the pressing plant or the master or something kind of lets it down and then it can be remastered or remixed. And actually, you know, you you get, it's like a director's cut thing, you know. But funnily um, enough, even then, um, like, like I, I worked with the band a long time ago and I was talking to them recently about this because the track, the album or the EP got mastered and I hated the mastering, but yeah, they right. had no idea and still love it and have had like comments about like all for years, like how much people like the sound of it. It's like, man, it's weird. Uh, there's been a, f- a couple of projects I've done like that um, over different genres where the mastering has been really different, but, and I've hated it, but people yeah. still enjoyed it. And I mean, like, so interestingly, um, if you go on any streaming service, you can find like six different versions of um, White Snake's 1987 album. Oh man, don't get me started. Four or six, but however, but like, I mean, I, I listened to another remaster of it like a month ago because I'm just trying to find the album, but I don't know which one's which. But they all sort of, they I guess they sound different, but none of them sound better or worse. Like I've never on that album been like, oh, I can't listen to the original version. The hi hat on Bad Boys is so annoying. <laughs> That's the thing I hate the most. And it is a weird sounding album, but the, yeah. the master hasn't fixed that. And it's been out for so long. Like, it's just. Why bother going back? Like, what are you going to, you're just going to make it harder for someone to do that. The um, the best example of this is, you know, there's also the thing of like, we went back and remastered it for the fans when really it's like, you know, behind the scenes business stuff, like mm. Diary of a Madman and Blizzard of Oz. I remember oh, buying. Yeah. Um, diary on CD and putting it in the car and being like, what is wrong with this album? Not realizing that they'd re-recorded the drums and bass. Yep. It's fascinating. It ties back into what we were speaking about last week with like, what are you getting obsessed about? And this is sort of the comment of like, you know, oh, you're tweaking this guitar sound, but the audience doesn't give two shits. Um, correct. But also like, I don't want to have a nice guitar sound for the audience. Um I want it for me so that I can play better yeah. um, and so that it can roughly represent the sound of the band. Once the front of house engineer gets their hands on it, they're going to do whatever they're going to do with it and it's going to be that mix that night in that moment. I'm totally at peace with that, but for me on stage, it's like, well, I want my rig to be easy to use and reproducible, so it's worth the time for me. Um, and again, I feel like the you know to tie into a point that you have there, it's like, okay, if I didn't spend this time tweaking my presets am I necessarily going to spend that time writing better songs? Also, probably not. Just this aesthetic, uh, you know, I feel like there was a comment I got on the channel, like, oh, all this technology has never been better, but, like, there's never, where are all the great songs at? It's like, they're out there. There's There's just so many. There's just so many good ones, but there's, it's like everything's gone boom and expanded where, yeah, there's amazing music. You just got to look for it because the... (laughs) It's so easy to just put anything out that there's also so much more crap. Um, there was like so, the thing that people never like really comment on it is there was so much shitty music 50 years ago. Yeah, man. It's, it's gone. like the like people a, forgot about it because it wasn't worth it. Yeah. There's like a filter in place here yeah. where it's like we only remember the stuff we like. But yeah, look at like the like manufactured 
bands from the 60s and 70s and it's equally a shit house. In fact, it's probably worse because people were figuring out how to make shit, you know, like fake bands and now it's like you can have bands that don't even exist. They're just some session guys and they're awesome, you know. It's like, yeah, this is um, we were talking to Michael Nielsen about like the League of Legends stuff, you know. Yeah, they're not real bands, but there's real musicians playing it and it's it's cool. I think Yorn Lande is on some of them as mm. well. This is just becoming the Yorn Lande podcast. Let's get him on. Oh, oh Troy. I'd love to get um, either of his guitar players on, actually. It would be really interesting to know what the like what the rig was and how they how they how they did it, you know, was it like we went into a studio or they did it at home and Man, like, I should just like, I'm just going to call, I'm just going to email one of them out of the blue or get someone on Instagram and be like, oh, you want to come on the podcast? I'm yeah, going to do it right now. Do it. Do it live. Because um, you remember like 2008-ish, uh, 2007, uh, so when we had first started playing together, you'd always rock up to band rehearsals with a new Frontiers album and then that got me into Frontiers just as a con- as a uh, record label to check out and just buy random stuff. I'm probably going to like it, you know? Um, but yeah, like we talked about Magnus Carlsen where he was like on so much of this stuff. And it, it's not like you couldn't have, say, a home studio where you just pump songs out, but it was a lot more expensive and a lot of the results weren't quite as good. And you sort of yeah. still needed a real... I, I, I might be incorrect on this, but I feel like you still needed a real drummer at that time to get really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Like... Superior drum was still there. Um, addictive drums was kind of still around. Like there was no, no Stephen Slate, but uh, well, in its SSD form, I suppose. Um, the, yeah. the sample's still there. So yeah, like fast forward like maybe five years and things change really quickly. DI guitar sounds whatever. It's completely fine. And like nowadays, Jesus Christ, you don't need anything. You just need like a yeah. laptop or probably an iPad just- and you can get like amazing sounds. Um, yep. So... Yeah, it's 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 funny, man. But yeah, those guys. Um, yeah, like maybe they use modelers. That would be kind of funny. It's just like pod yeah. guitar or something like that. Yeah, bro. It's just pod and like the slate samples and go to town and have someone pod, decent mix easy it. Easy drummer. That was a bit of a thing, uh, you know, when we were coming up the local Perth bands where people figured out it's like, oh, you can have Andy Sneap mix your album. Mm. You know, you just need the money and then to get him the the tracks um, and you know remember reading a thread in a local forum. It's like, yeah, we're going to get so-and-so to mix the single. And um, that's that's pretty cool as well, you know, where you can have these previously inaccessible producers and mix engineers and, you know, you can have them work on your stuff and lend their expertise to it. Yeah. Whether it's going to be the right choice is a different thing altogether, but it's kind of kind of nice. Yeah. Or you can just have me do it and um, it will sound completely cool. And, and where can they find you, Troy? Where can they do this? Right here in my new air conditioned studio. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it must be with the new air con, I should say. Go on. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to cut you off and say that uh, I've had a pretty pretty fat time chatting fat about chaps, some stuff mate. and Pine some philosophical things. Yeah, we um, should get some more guests on pretty soon. So I'm going to work on that. And uh, yeah, to everybody who supports the podcast, you're fucking awesome. Yeah. We should do another live as well soon. You want to do that? I'd happily do that, Troy. I'll Maybe put a could... thing out on my YouTube and we'll schedule it so people can put it in their calendars. Like next week or something, we could probably do something. Oh, uh, yeah. Cheeky little live podcast. Sounds Cheeky pretty good. Cheeky little... What day is this going to go up? Thursday? Oh, no idea. Mate. Happy birthday to my daughter. She turns two on Thursday, so... Um, well, there you go. If she, if she ever goes back and mate. watches this uh, when she's like of age, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if if we're all still dad. here... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, so that's what you were doing when I was too. Yeah, awesome. Uh, what are you after this weekend, mate? Uh, I'm in the studio um, all weekend, tracking uh, an album, and I have a couple of gigs as well. So it's going to be a busy weekend for this guy. What about you, mate? So you could say that you're working hard to make a living. Working hard, man. Yeah, it's it'll be fun. Uh, actually, got a fill in on um, uh, Friday night as well, so it'll be nice. Um, Very nice. What about you, mate? So you got Barrow Island tomorrow. Barrow Island, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we've got a show at the Rosie Friday night. So what time are you playing? Jam, jam packed. Oh, like nine thirty or something. Nine, oh, nine thirty. I think I'm gigging at that time. That's a shame. Oh well, um, that's all right. You're not going to miss much. <laughs> oh mate, just want to see the boys. You know, hang out. Um, yeah, see I was the boys. Say, if, uh, are you still doing the hen? Yep. Yeah, I was like, um, I, I should come down and um, bring. I'll bring the kids down. I'll have a chat. We got it, man. We got to catch up. Maybe, hey. 
Do you want to find some time next week? We'll do the next episode here. Well, Troy, I've got, that's a great suggestion. The other idea that I had, uh, after speaking to a friend of the podcast, Richo, we should definitely do a a gear podcast Christmas party and invite some listeners from Perth over and like have a barbecue. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, meat party. Meat party, exactly. Meat party, toilet party. We'll uh, we'll work on that, and uh, yeah. Until then, mate, take care of yourself. I need to get your Marshall back to you. Yeah, so I need it back. At some point next week, we'll uh, we'll catch up and make some noise. Sounds Thank you, good, everybody. Mate. Have a great day. Peace out. Bye.